Good morning. I have one minute. Hello, Christina. It's good morning. To everyone, it's great to see everybody here today. We all made it after the daylight savings time. I'm glad everyone either did not set their clocks or didn't overset their clocks. So I want to uh, go ahead and uh, ask for you guys to pray for me today. Um, you see I have a cup here, and if you remember last time I had some trouble with... Um, I don't know, just I guess everything <laughs> in my body. So I just want to apologize for that end of time. Keep me in your prayers. Um, something's, I guess, going on in um, the imbalance of whatever's going on inside. And I had trouble swallowing when I was speaking and, you know, tense dry mouth. And it's not because of nervousness. All right, so I have this cup. It's honey with lemon. It's not some cocktail, okay? So, um, so that's that. And I hope they'll go away. I did make an appointment for my dog, and I hope they'll go away soon or something. Maybe gosh, you're gonna teach me another lesson. So today, I wanna to speak to you about a topic that has been brewing in my heart, to say the least, and you'll get the title once I reveal it. Um, and I guess I've always wanted to one day speak about pain and all the wondrous things about suffering, but I haven't quite figured out a way to talk about it without bringing everybody in the pits and the valleys with me. Maybe someday it has to be that way. But for now, rather, um, I listen, I happen to be listening to a broadcast on family radio and I took it as a nudge to speak about difficulties in another way. Perfect storm. The perfect storm, actually, if you will remember for those who were more than 10 years old in the 90s, <laughs> it was actually a movie um, based on the book based on a true story. I heard the book was actually very good. It was excellent, actually. And uh, the true story was riveting. But the movie itself, horrible, <coughs> horrible. Um, and maybe it has to do with me sitting in the second row. I remember going with some of the ladies, Michelle, Mandy, uh, Lane. I think uh, we all got uh, seasick, um, no pun intended. We're in the second row. I could not figure out the waves from the ship and the person from the cargo. I don't even was in it, I was watching and looking for a character from one, scene, one screen to the other scene, screen, and I just realized he had died like 10 flashes ago. I'm like, where is that person? I can't find that person. It was, I don't remember what the story was about. But, after researching, uh, the perfect storm is a term coined by meteorologists, and it basically describes um, a storm that comes up that is made by elements, different factors, different elements. And all these elements have to be perfectly working together. The temperature, the weather, the speed in which it's spinning, the direction it comes from and heading to, the location, everything has to work together to make the storm to be the most horrendous worst storm in history that it cannot possibly be worse. Hence the sarcasm, I guess, of the perfect storm. So like in a storm, and I'm going to use four stories in the Bible, and actually these four stories could be a sermon in itself, so I do encourage everyone to go home and read the stories and you know, study it because they're four familiar and wonderful stories. I will use these stories as more of a metaphorical term of the storms in our life, and if you don't mind, as an English major, you know, uh, to use that as an analogy. So those who are not good with English, but you'll learn something new. So, um, as in a storm in our life, you know, as with that movie, there was a lot of tossing and turning and a lot of chaos going on, a lot of where are you, what's going on, what's happening, a lot of trying to stabilize the ship. And of course, just like in our lives, there's a lot of screaming, a lot of crying. Crying out, God help me, take me out of the storm. So with that, the first one, and actually it was, um, it was the first, the, the broadcast I actually listened to that helped nudge me in this direction. So you can run, but you can't hide from God. It's the story of Noah, Jonah, Jonah in the Old Testament. And Jonah is actually a familiar story, especially for those who've been in Sunday school, who sang the song Jonah and the big great fish, you know, <laughs> and being swallowed up. Um, even some non-believers know this story, they have their doubts, but they know the story. And I remember Jack had preached about this uh, particular story many, 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 many months ago. <laughs> okay, and so I will just go briefly through it, and again, I encourage you guys to read these four little chapters of the entire book in the Old Testament. So Jonah is a servant of God, a prophet. 
a preacher, um, just like uh, Jesus. Okay, he was called to speak the word of God when God gave him a message. And then so it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed, it said, for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish and fleed from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea and such a violent storm across the ship to threaten to break it up. And et cetera, et cetera, I included more. Here than in my notes. So that's what happened. So Jonah was a servant of God, faithful, I guess, up until this event. He had a message of God. He had a specific direction. You know, God gave him a specific direction, a message to tell the city of Nineveh that this city is sinning, it's it's making God quite angry, but God wanted Jonah to go to Nineveh and tell them that God will destroy the city in 40 days. So, you know, take appropriate action. If it were you and I, you would think that, okay, there's such a clear direction of message, I would go, right? Especially for someone who knows God as well as Jonah, or was in, you know, serving God. But no, what do you think Jonah says? And you'll read, if you go back home and read the four chapters, you'll say he is such a character, this man. And I don't mean like character like suffering produces perseverance producing kind of character, that kind of character. I mean, he is such a personality. He's... In his actions, he went the opposite direction, and he said, no, no, I don't want to do it to God. Uh, it wasn't like, God, I'm busy, this is too tough, I don't know what to say, uh, I don't want to go because the road is so lonely, I don't have friends with me, I'm weak. It's not a, like a moment of weakness. Do you know what his greatest complaint was? His greatest complaint was, God, you are too compassionate. You're too merciful because at the end, he says, if I preach and I tell the city of Nineveh, you know, God's going to destroy you in 40 days, they will most likely repent, they will fast, and they'll say, God, I'm sorry, I'll beg for God's mercy. You know what you'll do, God? You'll actually spare them. And they don't deserve your mercy. They really deserve you to destroy them. Isn't that pretty ridiculous as a servant of God? <laughs> you know, um, you'd think he would have the heart of an evangelism and want to spread that gospel, and hopefully, you know, all people will turn to God, right? That wasn't the case of Jonah. He actually said, no, 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 you're too nice, God. No, 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 I, I don't want to do it. They don't deserve it. And the passing point is, how many times do we do that? It's kind of shocking, but do we do that? Like, that person does not deserve my niceness. That coworker, no, I don't want to even act like I have Jesus. This person lies and cheats. He throws me under the bus. He takes all the credit for my, you know, a project, and he, he gossips against me. He's a scoundrel. No. I don't want to even show my mercy. He doesn't deserve my niceness, let alone my God's mercy. No, of course not. I don't even want to act like I believe in Christ. No, I don't want to tell this person that he's going the wrong way uh, because I don't want him to have the blessing of God. That's, that's pretty extreme. But I hope like, you know, when we get to this point, if we ever get to this point, that we will repent and learn that this is not the right attitude. So that's a passing point. So Jonah goes down, um, and he, he's in the ship, and it's funny how when we want to run away from God, it doesn't really matter where we're going. Just anywhere, take me anywhere, Lord. Just take me down anywhere, anything that's available, it doesn't matter who's with me. Um, and it's funny how people are kind, when we're trying to run away from God, and the, there's always some kind of casualty, innocent casualty along the way that we take with. People that are up with our shenanigans and, you know, it's kind of going all over the place with us. And, you know, they had just people who were on the ship that had, didn't have to go through the storm that, you know, Jonah had, uh, was at fault for. So he goes on the ship, and he goes to sleep, and he's like, you know, I'm going to chill. I'm, I'm not going to listen to God. He's like a kid. Like, he res like a kid who knows what to do, but it's like, I can't hear you, I can't hear you, God, I don't want to listen to you. So he's sleeping, and then it says, God sent a great storm, a great wave. And the people on the ship was like frightened, right? They're frightened, and even they're calling on their own gods, and hopefully, you know, their own gods will spare them, and they're telling Jonah, wake up, what are you doing? Call to your own god. And of course, Jonah's thinking, me and God, we're not really on speaking terms right now. I mean, he's speaking, but I'm not really listening. 
And you'll see that Jonah actually is a peculiarly peculiar person who is strangely aware, actually. He's stubborn, he's acting like a kid and quite immature, but he's actually quite aware of who God is. I mean, he knew that God would be compassionate towards him. He knew that the storm was sent by God and he's really at fault. And at least he was mad enough to own up to it and say, you know, yeah, you know, this predicament that you guys are in, my fault, I'm sorry. You know. And you will also see um, that how this ends, um, of course, in the spirit, but all these things in the middle you can go and read. But realize that the whole point of the story. And I think besides the theological foreshadowing that the Gentiles are God's plan of salvation have included the Gentiles and not just the fallen people, or the foreshadowing of Jesus' resurrection and him being, you know, buried for three days, etc. Besides that, I think the part that really triggered me, my heart, is God's discipline displays his love and his mercy. <coughs> and you know, and like Pastor Charles mentioned last week, God does not punish. He doesn't punish and 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 gives you a hard time because you did a, something wrong, but more so, the predicaments that arise in your life may be a form of discipline, because he disciplines his children. He will correct you, he will nudge you, and herd you back into the right direction. Now, hopefully, the storm of Jonah, um, we won't experience something quite as dramatic in our life, but if you are going through something, and if you feel like there's something in your life that I know I should be doing, God has told me, whether it's a command, whether it's a calling, whether it's just an impression of, of the Bible verse, and you know you should be loving, you know you should be honoring God on the Sabbath, and you're just blatantly walking the other direction, and you're wondering how come my life is out of control, it's going berserk. Maybe we should just ask him, like, did I disobey you? Did I, did you tell me to do something I blatantly said no to, you know? Um, are you trying to tell me something? Pay attention to these circumstances. Pay attention to what God is trying to do. Remember, he only disciplines his children. If you're not his child, don't worry about it. You know? I've always, I heard about this prayer actually from Pastor Anas as a kid. And I kind of learned it. And I know it's not because God's mean, but it's more like an attitude in my heart where I'm not so much scared as the pain and the trials, and those could be scary too. But I'm more nervous when and if I disobey him and I have displeased him in some way or another, and yet God doesn't do anything about it. He just lets me be. He doesn't correct me. There's nobody there to tell me that I'm doing something wrong. I'm, I'm dishonoring him. There's nobody to tell me to say, you know, you should get your life straight with God. You know, it's scary to me if God just lets me be and continue on that path of destruction. To me, that's scary. So in this story, that's what hit me. That when he disciplines his children, it really is his love and we should, like in Proverbs, Solomon tells his son, don't despise discipline. Don't despise correction because it is out of love. And the whole point of Jonah's story is that in his grace is displayed the relentlessness of his heart, not just to Nineveh, but to Jonah as well. Could God have rose someone else to go preach to Nineveh? Of course, I believe so. Everything, you know, in his sovereignty, of course he could have easily chosen someone else. But if his plan was only to save Nineveh, why, why go through all that trouble? So not only he did not let Nineveh go, he did not let Jonah go and included him in that grand purpose. And to me, that's, that's mercy and that's grace. I should pause and say that some things in our lives, the storms that rise in our life, passing point, not necessarily be from God or the devil or temptation. Not everything could be counted as a cross. Some things just happen entirely because of our foolish and stupid mistakes. You know, sometimes we blatantly make a mistake over and over again and we put ourselves into that predicament. And I just want to make that clear that, you know, we don't blame God and devil for everything. However, and I'm not saying that it has nothing to do with God that he doesn't have the power to do it. I'm just saying that, keep that in mind. <laughs> and, but however, of course, God in his wisdom and sovereignty, he can use everything, even our mistakes, if we have the right attitude. So that's Jonah for me. 
the discipline. You can run from God, but you can't hide, and technically you really can't run either without him being there, because it's funny how Jonah just runs, and he feels like just hiding in the bowels of the ship that he can really run from God. But, you know, I think we do that sometimes, too. So the second one is, fear or not to fear. So the second story, fast forward, fast forward to New Testament. New Testament in uh, the days where Jesus has his ministry. And he, this event comes from, uh, from a storm, of course. All of this you'll see is ship and water is involved. Okay. And then, um, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, so this happens, and I'm reading this story, and I'm just laughing because Halloween just passed. And a small part of me feels like this happened, and this storm happened, entirely because Jesus wanted to be funny. <laughs> he really wanted to scare the bejesus out of his disciples. Because if you read, um, the disciples were really freaked out. They, you know, grown fishermen, men, what dangers have they not been seeing, right? And they see Jesus walking on water, and they freak out, you know? So I'm thinking, like, if one day, let's say Pastor Chow is, let's say, at the retreat house that we were at, and he's like, you know, this meeting has finished, and uh, go meet us somewhere, go meet us at this baseball field, and then we're thinking, well, how are you going to get there, Pastor Chalice? It's like, oh, it doesn't matter. Just go on ahead. I'll meet you there in Saturday. And we would drive, you know, if you've been to Arnold, the house, and we, it's a uh, way to the baseball field. And we drive, and we park our cars, and we're like, man, he's here. Well, where's Pastor Chalice? And we're walking in the woods, and all of a sudden, Pastor Chalice floats through the trees. Okay? See, imagine how scary that is, you know? Our mentor, our pastor, our friend, I'm thinking, I don't care how long I've known him, I'd probably, like, pee in my pants, and I'd get a stick or something, or, you know, the wind's blowing through his hair and everything. And so I can imagine the disciples really, really freaking out. Okay, and um, so that's just a small part of me since Halloween just passed. <laughs> no, we don't celebrate the holiday of demons and ghosts, but I'm sure Jesus is like, I'll scare them with a miracle. <laughs> okay, so the story comes, when evening came, the disciples went down to the lake where they get into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. I think I put up here the account from Matthew, but I have here in my notes, it's from John, and I did change that. So, um, in... In Mark, Luke, and John, it writes the account of Jesus walking in water. But in Matthew, it includes the account of uh, Peter, our buddy Apostle Peter, always the brave and courageous one, always the one who's like the first to like jump out of the boat. And literally, he was saying, Lord, you know, if it's you, let me come out on the water too, call me to the water. And of course, he jumps out on the boat. So I included that one. Since I'm talking about him, I should the verse for that, and uh, you can go home and read the details for that. But when Jesus told them to go on the boat, and he says, you guys go on ahead, I will meet you on the other side. And when they did go on ahead, Jesus went up to the mountain to pray, had some quiet time. And I believe this happened for a reason. And he was, after evening and a few hours, the disciples were struggling on the boat. A strong wind came, another storm came, and they were really struggling. And Jesus on his mountains, I saw that they were struggling. You know, the boat was probably spinning in circles, or maybe they were having trouble going forward. And, and really, it's not that far to cross, but it's taking them like a whole evening. You know, I mean, it's a big place to cross, like a big lake or a big sea to cross, but it's taking them extra long, and then the paddling, they're not going anywhere, the paddling, they're not going anywhere, and the winds are coming. And it kind of reminds me of a scenario that Linda told me when she and Chris went canoeing as a <laughs> relationship building experience, and they were paddling and paddling, and they weren't going anywhere, they're paddling, and Linda's screaming, <laughs> and that's because they weren't really in sync. <laughs> but that's just the image that I saw. So the disciples were paddling, and Jesus, you know, thought that he should go down and meet them. And this is where Jesus is pretty, our Lord Jesus kind of really, really funny because he didn't just, obviously at this point, the boat is in the middle of the lake. At this point, however Jesus is going to meet them, it's going to be pretty supernatural, right? Otherwise, he might meet them when they reach land, but he didn't choose to just appear on the boat. He 
walked on water through the wind and the waves, so much that the disciples really got freaked out and thought he was a ghost. And they, they screamed and until he, Jesus said, don't be afraid, take courage, it's me. It is I, your Lord. In other words, recognize me in this storm. Recognize me in this situation. It is me. Don't be afraid. Sometimes in the storm and sometimes in the predicament, we don't recognize who it is. We don't recognize whose hand it is. And sometimes we may not even understand why. It's not discipline. I think I'm doing everything right. God hasn't impressed in my heart that I did anything wrong. But we don't know God. You are the one in control. You're the one in the middle of it. The situation has your mark. It has your signature. So whether it's your financial turmoil right now, and maybe your relationship has problems, maybe it's an inner turmoil to get your heart in the right place, you're struggling somewhere, you know, recognize it's God speaking. It's important to recognize what kind of storm. You know, another passing point um, is... We naturally don't want to do the will of God. I know we may pray it, we may sing about it, we may ask for it, but naturally we do not want to do the right thing. I don't want to show love when I really want to do is show hate. I really don't want to forgive this person. What I really want to do is take revenge. I really don't want to follow your will of God, but things, predicaments, situations are mercifully risen by God in His wisdom to align our will with His, align our desire with Him so that I can say, yes, Lord, I might not be willing, but I want to be willing to follow you. I might not naturally want it, but I want to follow you, you know. And I'm thinking like, and this is triggering off of a, a fellowship we're having and girls fellowship when I'm going through the Lord's Prayer, that when we say, Lord, let your will be done, and it took me a great while, I have to admit, that probably within the last seven, eight years, I finally realized that when I'm saying, Lord, let your will be done, I put this into your hand, what I really mean is, Lord, let this situation unfold as it is unfolding in my head, which is successfully. Does that make sense? It's like, Lord, I put this test in your hand, and what I really mean is, Lord, help me get an A, even though I didn't study. Lord, help me, you know, uh, I put my job in your hand. That means, Lord, make me successful. Make me, have, give me a promotion. Help me with this part. I mean, it's not wrong to be successful. I'm just saying that when we are really praying, Lord, let your will be done, we mean let your will be done at whatever cost and whatever that means. That God thinks is, you know, it's the right way. When we pray, Lord, I put finding a boyfriend or a girlfriend in your hand, and what we really mean is, Lord, give me the hottest person who is smart, who has money, who can hold a conversation with me, who's not dorky, who's maybe Chinese, preferably Christian, so I'm having a hard time with my pastor. And you know, did I mention a pretty hot looking person? You know, like, so we, it's, it's not wrong to have standards and wish lists. But be honest, you know, you can tell about what you want, but when we say, Lord, let your will be done, I put this in your hand, really, we are putting it in God's hand, and He will do what He wants when we're offering that. So that's supposed to be a passive point. So, so when a situation comes, and predicaments comes, and storms come, let it be that our will and our true desires are revealed. And our true self is revealed. Sometimes it is the scariest when our true we're looking at our true self in the nature. It's like, wow, that's that's not what, who I thought I was. I thought I had great faith. I thought I had great courage, you know. I thought I was smart, you know, I could make the right decision. I thought I loved God. And then storms and dangers come and testing comes and God's trying to reveal, no, not really, but that's okay. Because who is it? I'm on the other end. I'm the one who says, Peter, come out walk, and it's not by your might, it is by my strength. And it's not because we're awesome, but it's because Jesus is on the other side saying, come. So whether we are facing our fears, not by our might, whether we don't even have the courage to get in the boat for the, in the first place, or get out like Peter does, or maybe we do get through all that and we're walking on water, and we're like, oh my gosh, we're walking on water, and then, oh crap, I'm walking on water. Whatever situation, and we're walking towards Jesus, and when we finally do fall, know that Christ is there. Our Lord Jesus is there to reach up and uphold us. 
because it says in Isaiah that I have chosen you. I have not rejected you. You are my servant. So, so therefore, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am with God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I will lift you, uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's why it says to fear or not to fear. Now we can face our fear uh, because we're warriors, because God gave us a spirit that is courageous, that is not timid, and more so, He's the one who's upholding us and lifting us when we can't do it, when we're like, you know, <coughs> I'm done. That's too fearful. So um, nothing really scares me too much besides spiders and rats. You know, every girl is afraid of spiders. Um, ghost story scares me. You, you know that if you talk with me, I can't, I can't even look at a movie trailer on commercial that, you know, that's scary and I'm gonna turn around and I freak out. And then if you jump out of the corner, I'd freak out and stuff. But other than that, I am not too afraid of too many things. I mean, even in relationships with she, you know, I'd be like, yo, <laughs> so I like you. Um, you don't have to like me back. But I'm just saying prophetically, I think we'd be pretty great together. So yeah. Of course, that's not what I said. That's not like not that cool, you know. <laughs> but in a gist, you know, with the same motive and same attitude and same purpose, I did, right? You know, you don't have to love me back. But I'm gonna keep doing it until you change your mind, or if God presents another person, you know. So, so in that sense, I think that's one of my bravest moments too, because I don't know what got into me that I could have said that, because right now I probably would not say that again. So, so not a lot of things, but to stand up here scares me, and I don't mean it by public speaking kind of scare. I think it, to speak the word from the Lord, to stand here on His day, and to speak to 30, 20, 10, 15 <laughs> saints of God, children of God, it makes my heart shake, and it's supposed to beat, it's not supposed to shake, and again, it's not about public speaking, I was asked to uh, speak at our company event this past month, campaign for the community, and you know, VPs, directors, of course at the end I wasn't called I didn't have to do it at the end, but that was fine. I could do it, but here, even though it's a lot less, you guys are saints of God, children of God, and it, it, it makes me scared every time. But I realize that God's strength is really displayed, and you will see God's awesomeness and greatness when we are faced, and when we are utterly looking at our poverty and our nothing and our weakness, and we're looking at ourselves, we are nothing without you, and his strength is really displayed. I mean, sometimes, are you brave enough to look at yourself that way, or let yourself become in that state, a state of nothingness, so that his power and his everythingness can be displayed? Third story. It's kind of similar some people get these mistakes. There's two two occasions where you know the disciples on the boat again. They're on the boat, and but this time Jesus does go with them. Thank God, he does go with them, and but he's tired, so he goes below deck and he also sleeps. So all of a sudden they're caught in this squall again, winds and waves and everything, and and they're they're panicking. Now it's important to remember that these are fishermen. These are people who are experienced on the sea. This is not their first storm, not their first voyage. They live on the sea and I'm sure they've seen many, many uh, dangerous situations. They're like the sailors on The Deadliest Catch, who's watched The Deadliest Catch. It gives me a really great appreciation for my seafood every time I watch these men. I mean, they are, running around on the boat, they, it's storms, it's 20 foot waves, it's, it's dangerous out there, and they're not sleeping below deck, <coughs> avoiding all this, no. For a good part of the years, many months, night after night, these men are working on the boat. They're hauling the pods and throwing the pods back, and you know, work this big, you know, heavy, heavy metal crates. And they're working, and they're, they're sloshed around, and then on, on, if you see on the TV screen, you know, the waves will come, and then go on deck, and then the water will recede, and the men are still there trying to run around and get
get the, the fish and the crabs. So the crab that is sitting on your plate or on that chill plate in the Vegas buffet came with a high price. Someone could have died for your crab. Someone has to die. <laughs> Someone has died for your crab, I agree. <clears throat> That's why I don't eat Alaskan king crabs. <laughs> oh. So these are men. The disciples are not too unlike the men of the Bering Sea. Granted, this is the Sea of Galilee and not off the coast of Alaska. But same thing, okay? This the storm was big enough for them to worry and to panic and to really feel like my life is in danger. I, we, we will be toppled over. We will be swept away. And that's not easy for them to say. That's, they don't say that every day. Now, every night that they go through this lake. And they have reasons to believe that they could die. And they're like running around and like, where's Jesus? Oh no, Jesus is down below deck. And then of course one of them goes down and says, Jesus, you know, wake up, teacher, wake up. Do something. Don't you care that we die? Don't you care that we drown? So the third kind of storm, so violent that even our previous experience won't help us. There are some situations that God purposefully rose in your life that your previous experience won't prepare you. Now, I'm not saying that preparation won't help. Of course, we need, in times of trouble or times of peace, we should anchor ourselves in the Word of God, anchor our hope in Him, anchor our relationship with Him so that when situations arise, we're not tossed all over the place and we're not falling off the boat. But realize that there are situations where no other experience can prove like prepare you for it. It's something that will shake your core. Situations will come where your faith will be tested and you'll be forced to look at, wow, do I really have faith? Wow, do I really love God? Wow, do I really have strength? No, I don't. And there will be situations where you have no choice but to have to, have to run to Jesus. And what does he say? Of course, he gets up calmly. And just says to the wind and the waves, be still. And immediately the winds and the waves. And then he turns to his disciple and says, Do you still have no faith? And I find this is very interesting because this event happened immediately after one very uh, famous event, too. It's a really good, like, it was the miracle of feeding the 5,000. So if, imagine if you were there witnessing Jesus feeding the 5,000, and you're all charged, you came back from a revival, you know, everything's charged, and then this happens, you would think that the disciples would have some kind of faith, right? Maybe a run to Jesus earlier, maybe hide with him under the deck, I don't know, something. So notice that another passing point is miracles. Miracles, I have nothing against miracles. I've talked about it, I've, I have given testimony, I've experienced them in my life, I've also experienced in situations where God decides not to provide the miracle. They are great. I think they are a splurge of adrenaline. Um, they happen to encourage people who are struggling with their faith to encourage them and remind us that God is great. So I think miracles are, 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 are God's grace. But miracles by itself, as a witness event, really does nothing for our spiritual life in terms of our relationship with God. It doesn't deepen anything if the miracle does not some way, somehow, or another in our lives teach us something, a revelation about God's character, about God's nature, about His attributes, about His essence. Somewhere, somehow, we should reveal, we reveal that, wow, this miracle of God is omnipotent. Wow, he is so full of grace. Yes, you know, it is aligned with his word, and I'm going to hold on to that. And so in the next storm, I'm going to hold on to his promise. So obviously, this disciple, and it actually records in John, I think John or Mark, that after, actually after the feeding of the 5,000, their hearts grew hardened because they did not understand it. They saw the miracle, they were part of it, they were passing it out, but they did not understand. They didn't understand who Jesus was fully, they didn't understand why it happened, and actually their hearts got hardened. You know, it wasn't revived, it wasn't uh, energized, he, they didn't all of a sudden become more spiritual, but they didn't understand it. So this happened, and all of a sudden, they saw Jesus really display his awesomeness, 
his deity, his wow, this is, who is this man? Surely he is the Messiah. Surely, you know, this is someone great. This is not just some ordinary man. That even the wind and the waves listen to him. This is the creator who created light by saying, let there be light, just by a word. This is the creator that the waves listen to just by saying, be still. Because he created the waves and the ocean. And we can know this in our head. We can know it just by saying it and sing, singing it in our songs. But do we know it that when we enter our storms in our lives, when we enter our predicaments, do we know that I'm placing my life into the same hands that created this universe? I'm placing my heart in the same hands that was nailed to the cross. Of course he cared. Lord, don't you care that I die? Lord, don't you care that I'm going through this pain? How can you see me suffer like this? Don't you care? Do something about it, beyond dramatic like King David. Do something, I'm going to die. But of course he cares. Because he cares about our eternal future. Before we even care, we even care about what we're going to eat tonight, tomorrow. So never doubt that. Be still and know that he is God. Be still and know that he's the God of miracles, that he can perform it, not just, but not just what he can do, but who he is. All omnipotent omniscience, he's holy, he's loving, perfect. So, the fourth, I'm gonna use this last point as more of a closing instead of a full on point, because of time. And so the fourth, last point is about Paul, and Paul is not unfamiliar with trials and testing. I mean, he went to prison, he was persecuted. Of course, he did his own share of persecution before he became a Christian. But Paul was in prison. He was caught in a storm on a ship with a bunch of prisoners for 14 days. Then he was shipwrecked. And so you can go home and read about Acts 27. And there are some trials that are specifically for God's chosen people. They could be a combination of the three that we talked about. It could be discipline. It could be about facing our fears. It could be about knowing who God is and trying to be still. It could be actually something entirely different. Perhaps it's to bring us to a maturity. Perhaps it's to display his glory. But it is, it is Paul who writes in his letters that say, uh, you know, tells us about his thorn on his side that God did take away to keep him humble. And then in Peter, First Peter, uh, he writes, Peter writes, that we should take all kinds of suffering, they're suffering of all kinds, though they are limited, they have a limited time. So, you know, storms and situations, they don't last forever. They will be up, they will be down, but know who is in control. There are some storms who, some people who I guess God has specifically chosen to have their entire journey of life be a storm in itself. These people, not to say that they aren't happy or they don't have the joy of God, there are moments where uh, there are a lot of blessings and a lot of joy and a lot of good parts, but for the majority of their whole life there's this, a big storm and to learn this journey. And, um, a little bit like myself. You know, there are some things in my life that is going to go on for my entire life and that I will just have to learn. And um, I know Pastor Chellis has talked about maybe Priscilla is the Madame Guion of the Holy Ground. And, uh, and then, you know, a part of me really takes this honor because I recognize it's a privilege. And um, if it wasn't for God's choosing, I, I, can't, I don't even know how to ask for this, even if I wanted to. And, you know, for sure I don't want to. But God has really chosen uh, to work in my life in this way. That's a part of me that feels like I'm honored. But, but um, the, there's a part of me that sits there really uncomfortably. Because I know the truth. The truth is that if I was a normal Sunday Christian, if I had a challenge here or there, a little bit orphan trouble there and a little bit parent trouble here. If I didn't have all this, and the truth is this, 
that I must be some darn awful person to deal with if I didn't have all these things working in my life. I must be so far off the mark of what God wants me to be for him to use the entire life of my, the entire days of my life to fix me and to get me into a point of glory and Christ-likeness. So yes, I do take it as honor, and yes, I do take it as joy um, once I get past the whole you know, temper tantrum and like, oh, this is so painful, God, I can't bear it anymore, to get through all that. Yes, I do take it as joy because, man, I cannot imagine what a monster I'll be if I didn't have all that, and I will feel sorry for all new people because you won't have to deal with me all um, unworked on and un unmolded. So when James and the Apostle and Peter and Paul t encourages us uh, to count our trials as joy, to not shy away from discipline, to not, to really relish and treasure those moments, you know, we, we do it. So we have the first storm in, you know, learning that don't run away from God. Do His will. Honor. And the second one, to uh, recognize it's Jesus. It's God. And He's in the middle of it, so don't be afraid. And thirdly, to know that He is God. To really be still. Sometimes we just got to be still. Stop our running around in franticness. I know a lot of us are problem solvers. I'm not trying to calculate all the different opportunities and possibilities to solve this problem. To be still place our hope, place our joy in Him. So it reminds me of a song, you know. Uh, I think she shared on it another time where he uh, shared a message many, many, many months ago. Um, a song, Blessings, called Laura's, but by Laura's Story. And they go, the chorus goes like, What if blessings come through raindrops? What if healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know your name? What if trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? What if life's greatest disappointments or the aching of my heart reveals a greater thirst this world can't satisfy? So what if trials of this life, the rain, the storm, the hardest nights, are your mercies in disguise? Because it is God's mercy. It is His grace. So whether it's a privileged opportunity, or it's a temporary disciplinary storm, or it's just something you need to learn, you know, sometimes you just gotta ride it out. You know, with all the right attitude and with all the uh, preparation in God's word, sometimes you just gotta ride it out. You know, ride it out, whether you're in your image, you know, on a horse, as an eagle, or as a bow, I'm just gonna ride it out with his strength. Ride it out doing his will, ride it out glorifying him, write it out, not being bitter, because for sure, even if God doesn't transform the situation, God can still transform your heart without even changing the situation, because you are transformed. So write it out. Whether it's in pain, whether you know it's temporary, whether it's small or big, you write it out for his glory, and you write it out in joy, because it is the perfect storm that he has shown up for you. Okay, so let's pray. Dear God, I just want to thank you. I thank you for displaying your love throughout the centuries. Sometimes we just don't pay attention, but your love is there. Sometimes we just don't pay attention to the situation and the things going on in our life, and we're just trying to go through the motions of life. But Lord, sometimes your mark and your signature is in these little situations. Let us be keenly aware. Help us to listen to your Holy Spirit as you guide us to do your will. Help us to be willing to be willing to love you, to follow you. And when we say, Lord, let the waters rise, I will follow you, we really do mean it. But we don't mean it ignorantly, Lord. We mean it because we know you will uphold us, and you will guide us, and you love us. So I want to thank you. Continue to be with us as we continue our fellowship on your day. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.